Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm very happy to see, uh, I'm sorry, one second. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I'm very happy to see here uh, many students uh, of uh, National University of Odessa Law Academy. Uh, my name is uh, Mikhail Katzen. I'm a newly appointed uh, head of international office of National University of Odessa Law Academy. Uh, and uh, I'm very happy that uh, we uh, today are going to have a lecture of one of the most prominent uh, uh, economist, uh, politician, uh, civil activist uh, from Austria, who is uh, dealing very seriously with uh, uh, European integration of Ukraine, with uh, EU enlargement, uh, who organized many conferences uh, on this topic, uh, who really contributed a lot in order to uh, make a European continent uh, really a, a peaceful, peaceful place. Uh, so uh, I would like to introduce Mr. Günther Pfeffinger. And uh, before I will pass the word to Mr. Günther Pfeffinger, uh, I would like to say some words how we are going to actually schedule our time. So first of all, Mr. Pfeffinger will introduce himself, maybe will tell some words about himself. Then he's going to give you lecture. I submitted you uh, Mr. Günther's presentation. Uh, in advance, so you are aware about uh, the topic, you're aware about what uh, Mr. Pfeffinger is going to tell you about. So uh, after um, uh, Mr. Pfeffinger's lecture, you will be able to ask him questions. So I strongly encourage you to, particip to participate in the lecture, to ask uh, questions. Uh, and also uh, I would like to uh, remind you that this lecture will uh, going to be recorded and later it will be posted on uh, the YouTube channel of our international office department. Uh, so on behalf of the president of National University, Odessa Law Academy, um, uh, Professor Sergei Kival, on behalf of uh, Vice Rector of International Affairs of Odessa Law Academy, uh, Professor Andrino Gonikov, uh, I'm very pleased to uh, invite to the floor, our virtual floor, uh, our great friend uh, and great person, Mr. Günther Fettlinger. Uh, Mr. Fettlinger, the floor is yours. Thanks a lot. I'm very honored to be invited uh, to this uh, discussion. And um, Slava Ukraine, I would like to start with this. And also for victory of Ukraine, I'm very honored that I can address you today. And I'm looking forward to the discussions uh, which we will have after the introduction remarks. My name is Günter Fehlinger. I'm here speaking to you from Vienna in Austria, and I'm an Austrian economist and activist um, consultant uh, for EU uh, enlargement since 20 years. And I've been very active in most of the countries uh, since the last 30 years when it comes to transition from communism towards free market economies and integration in NATO and in the European Union. I've especially worked in the post-war environment of the Balkans, and also I worked for years in Ukraine, and I'm a big fan of Ukraine, and I'm very grateful that Ukraine um, is now today this invitation, but also I'm very much um, supportive of Ukraine here towards EU integration and NATO, which will, you will see during my presentation. Thanks a lot for that for the introduction. And now maybe, uh, Mikhailo, you can start with the uh, presentation. You can share the screen or? Yeah, sure, Mr. Fechlinger. Uh, oh, my assistant will now share the screen with your presentation. So uh, students will be able to go through your presentation while you will give your speech. Also, I would like to ask uh, uh, students to switch uh, on cameras if it's possible, uh, if they can do this, uh, because then it will help Mr. Pfefflinger uh, to give uh, even a better lecture. It will be easier for him because he will see uh, your eyes. So please, uh, uh, dear students, uh, switch on your camera if it's possible for you. Uh, so please, Mr. Pfefflinger, so now a presentation is on the screen. Okay, very good. Uh, thanks a lot. I would first like to congratulate Ukraine to be EU candidate uh, status country. This is absolute historic achievement and it's um, absolutely amazing breakthrough for Ukraine. 
in June 2022 to achieve this status is uh, really a big uh, achievement. And now Ukraine can of officially and fully focus on becoming EU member. I hope it will be very soon. And it's one of the reaction uh, of the European Union uh, towards the war that Ukraine got the status, also Moldova. And now in October, there will be also the question for Georgia to come from potential candidate status uh, to a full candidate status. And the same as well uh, for Bosnia and for Kosovo. I think these three decisions will also happen later this year. And also historically uh, that uh, North Macedonia and Albania got uh, the EU um, uh, start of the negotiations and the Bulgarian veto was overcome. That's also very historic uh, moments uh, for the European unification process. And that's uh, absolutely very uh, to be welcomed and I'm very happy for it. And the future of all of you will be in the European Union. And that's, uh, I think, something very important and it will change the life of everybody in Ukraine and it will also be a very good contribution towards the European Union Union um, success and the unification. Obviously, the context is very tragic because Europe has delayed for so long and it should have been uh, given to Ukraine already five years ago. But uh, that's uh, one of the tragic um, um, side effects of some of the tragic realities of Europe that uh, we can only in the crisis really unite but nevertheless, it's happened now, and that's very, very important. Here, I have made a list of the various uh, countries who are applying for the European Union, and that's my first call, obviously, to be fast and to be united uh, with all the nine countries which I support, and uh, some of them are very pro-European, but I'm also very much calling for the freezing of uh, the Serbian uh, EU candidate status, because Serbia has proven to be not very pro-European country and it's also not a very pro-Ukrainian country during the war now. So it's very important that we very much select which countries are really having a very good pro-Ukrainian policy at the moment. And that's, for example, Albania, Macedonia, also the Montenegro, where I'm very active as president of the Montenegro Austrian Association. But these countries have to be fully supported and have to be fast-tracked into the European Union. And I'm calling also for Ukraine to have a stronger um, alliance with these countries. This is very important. And uh, this is what needs to happen as well. Because unfortunately, Russia is also very active in the European Union, but also in the candidate countries with its nefarious policies. And so that's really very important that Ukraine is active in Southeastern Europe. To this extent, and that's part of the title of the lectures, I want to explain that after the war in uh, Yugoslavia and ex-Yugoslavia, the breakup wars, which lasted from 91 to 2001, the European Union has created a lot of institutions which helped very much for the reconstruction of uh, Southeastern Europe and the war-torn countries. This is especially in the Regional Cooperation Council, where all these countries are together. And that's a regional um, hub and network for economic and political reform. It's very efficient. Only problem, Ukraine is not member. That must change. Secondly, it's the Central European Free Trade Agreement, where all the countries are as well member. Only Ukraine is not member. Why it happened? Because all the events after 2008 have blocked Ukraine's Western integration. Now you have leapfrogged the integration directly to EU candidate status, but it's nevertheless very important that Ukraine takes a strong regional role as the most important country in the region to really also join together with the other countries and the uh, Regional Cooperation Council, SEFTA, and that I have argued in one of your journals, I put it there, that was my article uh, some months ago in the Odessa journal. It is a time for a European European Odessa dialogue, that means to make Odessa a hub of European integration, of regional integration, and also to this amazing city to have a regional role as a headquarter for a regional organization, and maybe also in the future to base that headquarter there. And that's really very important, Ukraine to join the Central European Trade Hub. Then I want to talk about NATO, because that's now, of course, in the war, the most important uh, organization. I was very critical that Ukraine has not intervened, also NATO has not intervened in Ukraine immediately 
after the start of the war. Um, but nevertheless, there is massive uh, military and uh, fiscal help now for Ukraine. That's very good. Um, but I think what is very important uh, is that Ukraine joins NATO. And that's the only way for lasting peace. There can be no security for Ukraine with a hostile Russia on the other side, uh, without uh, the security inside uh, the alliance of NATO. And so it's very, very important that Ukraine will be fully integrated very soon as part of any settlement uh, membership in NATO must be part of that settlement. I've um, also given you some overview of what's currently happening with the accession, and that's also very historic, uh, of uh, Finland and Sweden. Sweden was a neutral country for 200 years. It's now in NATO. And Finland was uh, the typical kind of uh, neutral country between the East and the West for so long. And it's now also uh, almost fully in NATO. There is already 20 countries which have ratified uh, this um, accession treaty. And here, the future accession countries in Southeastern Europe, here especially Bosnia and Kosovo, they want to join NATO. And they have made this very clear now. And of course, Albania, Montenegro, and North Macedonia already in NATO, Montenegro 2017, and Macedonia, the most recent member in 2020. Here, the overall map of NATO, and I think it's very clear. I have made also many, many articles now about the next step for NATO enlargement. We have actually to much faster enlarge NATO, include all the countries which want to join, because that's the only way together to be united, to be secure from a further Russian aggression. So far for EU Regional Cooperation Council and NATO, then let me also cover some of the economic points, which are very important as a road towards victory. Economics matter most. Wars, of course, they are decided on the battlefield. That's very important. But the decisions on the battlefield depends on economic parameters prior to it. And for the reconstruction as well, it matters very much which currency Ukraine uses. And we have made the following decisions after the wars in the Balkans in 2002 in uh, Kosovo and in uh, Montenegro. Uh, they were very effective, obviously, from the war. Immediately, the euro was in, uh, introduced. And all the other countries have also packed their currency uh, towards uh, the euro, like uh, Macedonia, like uh, Serbia, like Bosnia, like Bulgaria. And also before, it was the Baltic countries who have done a similar, a similar policy. And I'm very critical towards the currency policy of the last years because it is uh, really a constant devaluation which is harming the consumers and the businesses in Ukraine so much. Now recently again a devaluation and this is really very problematic currency policy for the savers, for the investors, for the consumers, for the taxpayers. It's really very bad and now that Ukraine is EU candidate country, obviously it's unconventional to think like that but I have argued many, many times now in the public that Ukraine must adopt the euro, first to back to the euro, and second, backing means a fixed exchange rate, and then secondly, uh, to also adopt the euro is much better, <laughs> because how the billions of euro which will uh, be needed to uh, reconstruct uh, Ukraine and to integrate uh, Ukraine into the European Union will be much better invested if we stop the constant devaluation of the Rivna and actually replace it with the euro is the much better policy. And then I have here published one of my articles. I have also shown that this was uh, possible in the case of Montenegro and Kosovo. This was the better policy. And this was also for the Baltic countries uh, directly after the fall of the Soviet Union, the best policy. They have basically jumpstarted and integrated themselves into the European direction fully and very fast and very effectively and very successfully so. Imagine the three Baltic countries were together with Georgia, Ukraine and Moldova, the three countries who are now in the EU accession direction. They were together in the Soviet Union and they have been so much more successful in the last 30 years since the fall of the Soviet Union why? One of the key reasons is they were without any compromise ready to adopt a Western policy and the currency policy, most of all. As you are students of law from Modessa, I also very strongly recommend everybody to, uh, to see this map because that's the European trade map of the European trade integration. 
because it's always very important to understand what the EU ultimately is. We are a world trade uh, organization, a notified trade integration system. So this map is very important. And this is the map of the trade agreements. Ukraine has a free trade, a deep and comprehensive trade agreement that works actually very well. And that's a wonderful achievement. Now in the war, even Ukraine has deeper integrated into the um, I think the next step as well is to be a part of the customs union, because you see that with uh, Turkey here, we have a customs union. <laughs> That's really good and much better integration than with Ukraine and even with the Western Balkans. So here, the next step must be a full customs integration, and these things can go relatively fast. I have also to talk about uh, tax rates. Because what I'm also critical towards Ukraine is the taxation rates. When you see the Western Balkan countries, they were much more aggressively cutting uh, tax rates towards 10% and uh, flat. And that was really very good. And Ukraine has not so uh, aggressively tried to improve the competitiveness. And now, after the war, hopefully, will be won. The question is how to win the reconstruction and how to win the EU integration rates. And it's very important to be more competitive and therefore lower taxation matter very much as well in the income tax area. There is a, a really deeply problematic tax code and I hope that this will change now very soon. One other topic which I also want to discuss is about corruption. That's very important when, because when you see what has Georgia achieved, uh, and this was really quite amazing. Georgia is better in anti-corruption, in transparency international index than even several of the EU countries. <laughs> and that's quite an achievement, actually. <laughs> that's really very good. But uh, the thing is, Ukraine, unfortunately, here has a big uh, way forward. Many things are happening now in 2022, but uh, they are really very important because we have to build also a consensus in the European Union that the EU candidate status is not just theory, but it's a practical accession direction. So the reforms now in the next months, they have they are anyhow happening parallel to all the other uh, things, but it is important to have a major push on anti-corruption as well. But also the European Union has to do much more because unfortunately it's not that we in the European Union have done uh, good enough. Most of the military help has come actually from non-EU countries. Uh, it was the Americans, the British, the Turkish, and they have delivered um, weapons. And uh, the European Union countries, some of them have uh, delivered a lot, like Poland and the Baltic countries, but Germany is definitely not enough. And especially what is the task, obviously, of the European Union, in my view, is the fiscal and the financial support and the reconstruction effort. And my calculation is, that the energy transition and the reconstruction of Ukraine, the rearmament of Ukraine, it will be overall a very big um, uh, package of financial needs which will be necessary to give. Because ultimately, when you look at, we had in the COVID crisis about 750 billion, which was uh, funded. And in the current crisis, uh, the war, the effects of the war, the refugee crisis, the energy transition, the artificial energy war, which Russia is now waging against the European Union. Just uh, yesterday, Russia was uh, then uh, shelling the electricity infrastructure in Kharkiv. And the idea basically of the Russians is by taking a lot of energy out of the market of Europe and by artificially making a lot of destruction in Ukraine to create a major economic shock for the European Union. And uh, that is also what's partly happening. Don't worry, in that sense, we are strong enough to uh, bolster that. But nevertheless, it will be expensive. And it is also, uh, we need to be a little bit more courageous uh, to packages in a new debt instrument. That's also my, my call. And to call it uh, after Helmut Kohl, I think that would be really very much the best way to do it. And uh, we need more German support financially. If they don't want to deliver so much weapons, at least they need to uh, pay much more uh, for Ukraine and for the energy transition. And the estimations you have seen, I'm sure many of you have seen it in the media and in the reports, Ukraine needs about 105 billion euros still this year in fiscal support uh, for victory and uh, for 
also keeping just the state running and operational and uh, the energy shock because Ukraine will um, need to import a lot of energy as well in uh, 2022 before the winter. And so it's really very expensive and the Germans unfortunately have not uh, lived up to their promises and this must change. And most important, also my concluding remark, I'm very active also on social media to call for German tanks uh, for Ukraine. And this is very important. And I'm also calling for Austrian tanks, but we have a much a smaller defense industry. But it's a very big problem that Germany and uh, to some extent Austria, we have not been living up to our role and our support for Ukraine was not enough. And I want to apologize also, and I'm calling very much on social media, I'm supporting uh, this campaign. And I think it's very important that the West uh, delivers more weapons uh, that you can reconquer the unity of your country and that you will win against the Russian aggression. This is me basically in a nutshell. I'm also having a YouTube channel and a Twitter account, my LinkedIn account, and a lot of uh, the other um, reports and activities. And I'm very happy if we are contributing and if you are um, supporting uh, these topics. And also I'm happy for the debate now together in the coming moments. Thanks a lot and Slava Ukraine. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. F Thank you very much, Mr. Fettlinger, for such interesting contribution for your presentation. Again, I would like to express my uh, sincere gratitude for your efforts, which you constantly apply towards uh, the enlargement of European Union, uh, towards the demising of the concept of uh, post-Soviet space. Uh, uh, and uh, campaigning for uh, uh, EU enlargement for Ukraine. And I think that uh, you actually contribute a lot for uh, Ukraine uh, getting uh, a candidate status uh, this summer. So thank you very much. Uh, and uh, now I would like to ask uh, students, uh, dear audience, uh, to actually pose their questions to Mr. Fettinger. And I'm sure that this part of the lecture uh, will be even more significant uh, than previous one. So please raise your hands and uh, Mr. Fackinger will be very happy to respond to your questions, please. Uh, okay. Uh, please, uh, uh, Anastasia Boshko, you're welcome. Um, yeah, I thanks a lot for uh, Mr. Fellinger uh, for this lecture. And I want to ask, uh, so uh, you said that it's good that Ukraine, uh, if Ukraine uh, gets in uh, NATO. So I want to ask, uh, what do you think, um, if Ukraine really joins NATO, will it cause, um, will it help to protect Ukraine better or uh, will it cause repeated aggression from our neighbors? Thank you. Look, um, and since NATO was established in 1949 as an answer to the Soviet aggression, because NATO was established because Stalin wanted uh, to take over Greece, Turkey, and he has taken over Czechoslovakia and Poland before. So that was basically the American answer to unite free Europe and have no further countries uh, being integrated into Soviet uh, Union. And that was in 49. And since then, NATO was never attacked again. Uh, so we are a powerful alliance. We have this American nuclear um, umbrella, which is very effective and very powerful technology of destruction in case of attack. And we also have the military and fiscal and industrial capacity to defend uh, the NATO territory. And um, led by the Americans, uh, we had actually no doubt that we will always be defended. And there is, I think, a few doubt in the world that this will be the case. So also when you think about the future, Ukraine absolutely needs to be inside NATO because otherwise you can never be sure that maybe you have an armistice one moment and then the next year when the weather is fine and um, Putin has found new soldiers and new tanks, then he will come back again and he will start the whole disaster again. So where's your security? And there is also a debate, you know, that uh, some countries uh, can secure and give some guarantee 
Uh, maybe you followed this uh, debates in Turkey in the spring, but I don't know which country should that be because it's only NATO countries in Europe mainly, and um, we don't need China to guarantee the security in Europe. So it's question either we are all together in uh, fighting and uh, securing a secure Europe, or we are divided. And I'm in favor of a um, united Europe. And so the question about Ukraine's membership, um, you know, I know that Putin is always saying that uh, the war is about Ukraine wanting to join NATO. So a lot of people in Europe say, oh, we shouldn't uh, do that because then Putin will be more angry. But, you know, he has already started a terrible war and he has killed so many people. So what else he should do? <laughs> so. In a way, the question of war and peace is already decided. He is for war, we are for peace. And the only way to keep him out of Ukraine long term and out of Europe, because he is also waging energy war against us. He is brutally abusing the good trust we had in him, in a sense, by buying commercially and allowing him to sell his stuff in the European market. He has absolutely abused it. And so I think there is no alternative uh, to a NATO membership of Ukraine, and it's also the best thing we should have done already 10 years ago, because then the whole year, uh, war would never have taken place. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Anastasia, for your question. Please, I see another hand. Yelizaveta, uh, uh, please, you're welcome. Thank you. First of all, I want to, to thank Mr. Fenger for an information informative lecture. Unfortunately, now I cannot switch on my camera, but my question is about the introduction of the euro on the territory of Ukraine. At the moment, the aggressor country is like massively trying to destroy Ukrainian culture, even partly claiming that it didn't even exist. And uh, like, uh, don't you think that the preservation of the hryvnum as the main currency in Ukraine would be significant for the preservation of Ukrainian culture and the uniqueness of the nation as a whole? Thank you. It's a good question, but I tend to think that, uh, first of all, <clears throat> the proud of a country it can be the military and the history, and, but uh, can be also the economics. <laughs> but uh, the paper on which a currency is printed, you know, we have a different tradition now in Europe because we have decided to be proud about Europe and we have the European currency and it's actually working very well. It has uh, given us a lot of additional prosperity to have one common market with one common currency. And it has helped us to avoid the internal mechanism of devaluations. Because what it means, devaluation means, for example, until we had the euro in Europe, and then we had Italy, who was in every crisis devaluating the lira against the uh, shilling, the Austrian shilling and the mark. Yeah? And that was creating a lot of unfairness because You had a lot of um, economic hardships for the consumers who were suddenly much poorer. And I was myself as an economic advisor working for the EU on many events in 2016. And I was uh, then, uh, I was more on economics working. And then you see a lot of uh, businessmen uh, from uh, at this event. Hey, Mr. Fellinger, I uh, had so much money on my bank account until 2014. And then came the currency crisis 14, the currency crisis uh, 15, and all the constant devaluations. And now I lost uh, hundreds and thousands of euros. What can you do about it? Yes, <laughs> I could do nothing about it because the money is lost. So this devaluation policy is very, very deeply problematic. And I think uh, a lot of people, maybe you and your parents, you can remember when the uh, Rivna was starting at, I don't know, it was uh, at two and then it was at eight uh, to the dollar and so on and so on. You need, of course, a realistic exchange rate. And, but the question is how much lower you want to go with the Rivna. And that's, of course, I think uh, much better to have the Euro. And I understand, you know, also in Kosovo and in Montenegro, they had debates if it would not be better, you know, to have an intermediate currency or to keep uh, the currency because they are proud people as well in Macedonia and you know everywhere. And the thing is, 
you know, it's very expensive um, a tool to be proud of if it doesn't work very well. And when your future is anyhow decided to be a member of the European Union, and you all in your lifetime will be EU citizens, same like me. <laughs> this will maybe not take 10 years, like I hope. Uh, maybe it will take 30 years, like I don't hope it will take so long. But you will be for sure EU citizens. Why not to jump forward and uh, do the Euro decision immediately? And I think it's the much better way to have stability. All the investments which will come from the external countries into your country will be then for sure secure and safe. <laughs> all your investments and of your parents, all the money will be safe. Yeah? There will be clarity what costs what and your integration in the European market will be much faster because there will be easier, there will be clarity in the price and there will be no changes, artificial changes anymore by the risk of devaluation. And it will also make it very, very clear where you belong to as Ukraine, <laughs> you know, because uh, that is something the currency you need to think in the currency when you decide about what to buy or what to consume. You need also to uh, to invest in the currency. You need to trust the currency. You, every day you have hundreds of transactions which are in the currency. Doing it in the euro <laughs> is a very powerful uh, symbol of European future of Ukraine. And uh, that's, I think, the most important um, tool we have uh, ultimately. And I think it is, of course, you know, there is resistance because the politicians don't like that very much because they have less control of the central bank. Because the central bank normally in any country is the tool of control, unfortunately, of the political class. And especially in Ukraine, there was a lot of manipulation in your central bank in the past and a lot of uh, corruption. Because yeah, and then you can decide which bank gets funded, which bank gets a license, where to put extra funding lines. And there's huge amounts of level of corruption on that one. So having no currency to manipulate is, of course, very difficult for a political class. But it's very good for the consumers and for the businesses because you can trust in the future of the security of your currency. And there's also the reality that Russia has introduced uh, the ruble in the Crimea. And um, I'm not sure about uh, what is exactly happening in the occupied territories in the East, and I hope they will be soon liberated. But uh, I think the one thing Europe has done really very good is the currency. And that's, I think, something Ukraine, after this example of Montenegro and Kosovo, could do. And I'm promoting this because it would leapfrog your development into the European internal market very fast. And it would make it adamantly clear to everybody that you want and you will be in the European Union. Uh, thank, thank you, you very so much. much. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Mr. Bethlinger, for your answer. Um, I would like to pass uh, the word to uh, Ivan Shinka Bagdan. Please, the floor is yours. You are allowed to ask questions, please. You're welcome. Yes. Uh, first of all, I want to, to thank uh, Mr. Fellinger for such an interesting lecture and uh, ask one question. So before the Russian invasion of Ukraine, uh, a lot of Western country, countries, uh, our partners were informed that in February, at the end of the February, Russia was going to invade uh, Ukraine. And my question is, what, what, what do you think? Uh, why so many countries, United States, European countries, uh, didn't prepare uh, financial support, military support uh, for the beginning of the war so that they can immediately uh, supply as I said, this support, why did they uh, wait for such a long time? And uh, for example, I mean, like, why did we start the war on our own without the uh, help of our partners? Thank you a lot. Yes, I'm very sorry that you feel left alone, but I want to make a difference here because the Americans never left you alone. The Americans were warning of the invasion the Americans were very fast to send money and uh, also military supplies. <coughs> you got a lot and you got it very fast. Yeah? And also <coughs> the Americans and especially the British have also trained your military very well in the last eight years, the Canadians as well. And so when it comes to the European Union, 
look, there's also big differences in the European Union. The Polish and the Baltics were always uh, very strongly with you and were supporting you from day one and also in between in the eight years where the war was already going on. The problem is, I know, and I'm a very critical also to Germany and Austria and uh, to many of the appeasement countries in the European Union, but it's very probably, you know, there is a historic context which is to be understood. And uh, we, um, as uh, the German speaking people, there's a big uh, cultural resistance uh, towards military violence in political affairs due to the World War II. And I can remember in the 1990s when it was uh, the first Iraq war and the Germans were still completely pacifist nation at that time. Yeah? And uh, the role to uh, project power and German tanks uh, to be sent uh, to Ukraine is, um, yeah, it is um, a difficult concept to explain still today to the um, Austrian and German public uh, today for these reasons. I know that's not a very good argument, but nevertheless, I don't want to, it's an important one to understand. The second one is also that uh, the Russian influence is also very strong in the European Union because with their uh, energy uh, purchases, they have systematically bought a lot of influence as well. And uh, Putin is a very powerful communicator also in our media systems. And it was unfortunate that we have not really responded well enough towards the Crimea annexation because we should have been much more adamant and the people like me in the Austrian public, uh, we have always warned that there will be a, a, future, a future escalation and we have been uh, prepared um, from our side and we called for preparations, but unfortunately the mainstream uh, political leaders in the last eight years, they were blinded by the opportunities of Russian gas and they believed all these kind of Russian arguments that uh, they um, will never continue this war. And that was a major tragic mistake. Now everybody apologizes, but we have to uh, somehow be better prepared the next time. And also together to make sure that it will never happen again. And the only guarantee for that is NATO membership. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fecklinger. I completely share your point of view. Actually, uh, our President Zelensky, the President of Ukraine, he called the West to impose sanctions against uh, Russia even prior to uh, the start of uh, full-scale Russian military, military aggression uh, against Ukraine. So I reckon uh, President Zelensky he actually gave uh, an interview to Washington Post maybe in January this year, so one, one month prior. Russian uh, invasion. So he called for uh, uh, full scale sanctions against Russia, but unfortunately, uh, Western leaders, they were not ready to uh, send a very strong signal to Russia to stop operation for the full scale war, unfortunately. Uh, please, so Ksenia, you're welcome to ask questions. Yes, thank you very much. First of all, hello to everyone and thank you, Mr. Felinger, for such a nice lecture. So I wanted to ask about entering um, Ukraine to the EU. At the host of the summit, French President Emmanuel Macron actually said that the bloc wouldn't make exceptions for Ukraine and his comments actually echoed those by Deutsch, uh, Dutch Prime Minister Mark Root, who previously said there was no such thing as fast tracking of accession, that it just doesn't exist. And German Chancellor Olaf Scholz also was against the idea pointing instead to the association agreement that the EU made with Kiev in 2017 as a way to deepen ties. Yes, so um, he standard that it's very important um, to continue to pursue the things that have been decided in the past. And um, my question is, um, like, what is your personal opinion? Do you consider accession of Ukraine to the EU as a devaluation of the procedure of entering to the European Union? Thank you very much. Look, the accession normally takes 15 years of preparations. You have really started in 2014 with the Aromadan revolution. So 29 is absolutely possible technically. Yeah? And your preparation level is also very advanced. 
what is true is now in the war you made actually much more preparations and much faster preparations than in the years before because of the political deadlock in Ukraine before the war. It was unfortunate that you lost some years and also you lost some years of reform because of the internal fights. Yeah? But the situation is now 2029 is technically possible. It would be also very good to learn the names of the EU leaders because uh, you mentioned Mr. Rutte and Mr. Macron and Mr. Scholz. And in the perception of the foreign, of the candidate countries, I said uh, not foreign countries, but internationally, they seem to be the EU leader, but they are not. <laughs> the EU leaders is Mrs. van der Leyen and Charles Michel and Roberta Metzola, the parliament president. Yeah? And these are the real leaders who make the decisions about uh, the European future. And as we have seen, now this was exactly the case <laughs> because all of them, Macron and Scholz and Rutte, they were very much against Ukraine, <laughs> CEU membership and candidate status from 2017 to 2022 until May. <laughs> and just in June, they have changed uh, towards the candidate status under the immense pressure of the smaller countries, of the Eastern countries, and of the EU level um, personalities like Mrs. van der Leyen, who made it very clear that her role in the world, in the EU, is to get Ukraine into the EU. You have a real friend here because she knows that this is what the Americans demanded from her. And this is what the moral imperative of the moment was. And also it was always the historic place of Ukraine in the EU. So what is important? Yeah? Don't focus so much on the national leaders of the member states but focus more on the EU leaders. And what I also miss, and because we are talking to law students here, it's very important and that your generation of law students is an expert in European law, because it will be applicable in your country very soon. You will see things will change dramatically fast in the next years. And this is very important. I have seen in my years in uh, Ukraine and Kiev, I have seen a lot of people who theoretically knew Europe but they thought it's a combination of member states. Yeah? And they were very much interested only in Germany and France, basically, and the rest, they didn't care. Yeah? And they didn't really know how the commission works. They didn't know how the council works. They didn't know anything about European unification history. <laughs> and I made many lectures and I told them about the Treaty of Rome <laughs> and about uh, Jean Monnet <laughs> and about all this European law being superior to your Ukrainian law when you are a member and that you will be a member of a federal European Union. And for example, that your currency will be abolished <laughs> because it's the Euro in our country. And then everybody told to me about a proud uh, Ukrainian nationalist and you want to be more stronger like uh, Poland. Yeah? And that was, of course, very unfortunate because you have to be more federalist than the federalists in the European Union. You have to be more European than the European and you have to be much better prepared. What is the European Union law and what is the European unification process than even many of the old member states? And many of you will be, I'm sure about it. But that's my answer here. The European Union is ready for Ukraine. You have to fill, fulfill the criteria. It's simply that we have these laws in the European Union. That's our common regulatory achievement, which we have done the last 70 years. That's called acquis communautaire. And anyhow, you have adopted about 60% of it already. And the rest is daily work of the RADA to adopt more. And anyhow, it's not a negotiation process between Ukraine and the EU, it's an adoption process. It basically de depends how much power, how fast you give to Brussels in the, and how much you adopt the Brussels uh, regulations. And the faster you do that and the less complicated you are with defending your oligarchic interests and your vested interest and your political elite's interest in certain things, and then uh, the faster you can be technically ready and once you're technically ready, there is only a political argument to be made. And I think that will be won. Of course, you know, that's a battle in some years ahead. But now, after the decisions of the candidate status, and I think also the start of negotiations will come, because the preparations in Kiev are now very good, then it's really a question of speed and of uh, preparedness of the Ukrainian elites uh, to make this opening towards the European market to adopt, um, for example, to allow foreigners to own land <laughs> and foreigners like me. <laughs> that was the big debate in your land reform that you didn't, I said, you know, 
when there was the land reform default. I said, you know, you want to be in the EU, so allow the EU investors to own land. <laughs> That's what we call the freedom of capital. <laughs> but they were not ready for that. I said, allow the EU uh, citizens uh, to work uh, very easily in Ukraine and open your labor market and don't make it so complicated. We are not uh, like Africans, yeah? Uh, but this was not possible because you were not ready for this openness. So I argued always, make a unitar unilateral openness in your markets uh, towards um, energy and that happened now in the war and uh, in all aspects basically. And that's also part of my, uh, it's a bit of a provocation why I say adopt the Euro, because what bigger thing you could do than to adopt the Euro to show that you really want to be in the European Union, because ultimately you have to convince the European leaders and the European public and the European media that you really want, because you are a very big country, you are very expensive to integrate, it will cost hundreds of millions before the war to integrate Ukraine into the European Union, and now it costs double the, uh, double the uh, price. So I estimate before it was 350 billion and now it's 700 or more actually to integrate Ukraine when you see that you have to bring all the infrastructure and all the technical standards, everything to EU level. And that's a huge amount of money. And uh, you have to convince uh, the Europeans as well by being basically the best student in town. And that's the way to do it. Otherwise, when you are like, uh, aligning yourself on the patriotic front with Kaczynski in Poland, there will be very little appetite uh, to integrate Ukraine uh, when you behave like that. And so ultimately, it very much depends on the post-war decisions uh, now, how fast you adopt European regulation. And I hope you will be very fast because I would love to see Ukraine in the European Union by the end of this decade. Uh, Thank you very <clears> much. Mr. Kachnagara, thank you. But uh, from uh, other point of view, we can see, for instance, Montenegro, who which actually adopted Euro, but still Montenegro out from European Union. And uh, we don't know when Montenegro is going to join European Union. Uh, maybe uh, it will take uh, another five, 10 years for Montenegro to join European Union. So, and from our other perspective, we see Poland, uh, which refuses to adopt euro because of Polish authorities think that after the adoption of euro, the rises can uh, the, the prices can come up. Uh, so they prefer to stay with uh, their Polish national currency. So this is a uh, question is really uh, debatable. So I would like to pass the word to um, uh, Ms. Christina Gritzik and please, uh, Ms. Gritzik, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Fellinger, for this lecture. It was absolutely interesting for me. And uh, my question is, uh, what is the point uh, in funding some international organizations, such as, for example, the International Atomic Energy Agency, uh, when at the moment when it's most needed and in the moment for which it was originally created, it proved to be completely useless and unable to uh, slow some problems? Uh, I mean, nuclear one. Yeah, it, I completely agree with you. It's a very big problem which we have in the United Nations because the International Atomic Agency is some part of that sector. <clears throat> what we have in the problem is that Russia is always the veto power. The problem comes from 91 because we should have never allowed Russia and to be the successor of the Soviet Union because Soviet Union was 260 million and uh, had a this kind of size and Russia only half of it. But in some Western appeasement drive, we allowed Russia to keep the nuclear power and also the nuclear weapons and also to sit in the nuclear, uh, also in the Security Council. And therefore, the UN is completely useless uh, organization in uh, major issues. Of course, the UN has some things to do on the soft law and, you know, on health, on governance, and it's not a useless organization. I don't say that. But when it comes to questions of war and peace and the concern for China and for Russia, and then obviously there comes always a veto and, oh, and then it's also completely blocked. And the same is with the international atomic energy uh, situation because all these people are very much depending with their jobs on Russia as well. <laughs> because if they say something wrong, then Russia in Vienna then later will not prolong their contracts and block their appointments and so on and so on. So this is a totally biased and complicated and wrong uh, way to do it. 
And I'm very sorry because it's a big risk uh, that this nuclear power, the biggest in Europe, is now occupied by Russia. And basically, Russia is abusing it as a kind of nuclear blackmail against Ukraine and Europe and the world, that they are threatening uh, this uh, nuclear security. And it's an absolute disaster. So I'm completely against this EIA mission. It was a real big mistake. And what we do, what we need to do, in my view, is to military liberate uh, Zaporozhye and then uh, to make it a military, a Western military uh, occupied zone, and then to give it back to Ukraine, obviously, once that is uh, the Russians are put out of this region. But nevertheless, it's a really major problem of international governance that a uh, aggressor nation like Russia is a rule uh, giver in via its veto power in the Security Council. And all these questions about ERR are connected with this UN veto mistake, which we allowed Russia to stay in this important and powerful position in the year 91, 92, when the succession question of the Soviet Union was putting itself. And it was the mistake of the West to allow that in that day. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Christina. And last question, uh, uh, Andrew, please, you're welcome. Thank you, thank you. So my question, uh, Poland increased their army in several time, uh, times and want to buy hundreds of uh, HIMARS. Doesn't it mean that Poland doesn't trust NATO? And will European countries increase their army and prepare it on a higher level like a Poland? Look, I'm a bit critical to all this uh, new found uh, fund to invest in defense. Yeah? Because why? The real thing is what we really should do is now all available artillery and tanks to send to Ukraine. Because there the battle is today about our future uh, funding and our future defense efforts. What is happening in some years? Yeah. And that's a long-term question. And it's, of course, good to have HIMARS in Poland, and why not? Yeah? But uh, the military capacity of Russia is not given for a military attack on all of Europe. Yeah? They can even not win this war now in Ukraine because of uh, Ukraine being in between and being ready to defend Europe and Ukraine, first of all. So ultimately, that we should um, have massive uh, tank rearmament of Germany and of Poland. <laughs> Geography is simply like this. There is, uh, there is Ukraine and of course the Baltic countries and Finland. This is the front line with Russia and it will be for the long term because the next years you will see that Russia will break apart and there will be complete and utter chaos and violence over there. So what we need to do in the first years is really that the Ukraine, Finland, the Baltic countries and Poland to some extent they need to be uh, having a military border against the East. And that is the most important, but we don't need to, to build a, a massive militarization of Europe. I don't think that's necessary. We need a militarized border towards, uh, towards um, Russia. And we need now to support Ukraine much more to be able to defeat in these decisive days, which we are coming now in the next six uh, weeks or until the end of November, when the fighting conditions will be no longer so stable. So now it's important that we give enough weapons because this will make all the difference. Because if Russia is defeated now militarily, at least mostly in Ukraine, and there is a major withdrawal, that will shake up the Putin system. And then we will have, um, of course, uh, the task to rebuild Ukraine, to rearm Ukraine. And also then Poland can do its part. But um, what the 100 billion, for example, which just uh, recently Germany has decided, you know, okay, yeah, but nobody will attack uh, Western Europe. They will never come so far. We need really to do much more for the defense of Ukraine now. This is the paramount priority now, and this is the road to victory. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Fechninger. So I would like to ask you the final question. And uh, my question uh, will deal with uh, uh, Hungary. Uh, 
we know that in 2016, when uh, British people, they voted uh, actually for opting out from European Union, uh, this was like opening a Pandora box. So it was the first time in the history of European Union when the state left European Union, uh, according to uh, the procedure prescribed by uh, Article 50 of the Treaty uh, on the European Union, actually, which uh, was uh, incorporated in the treaty uh, after the Lisbon procedures. Yeah? So now we have uh, uh, rumors about the possibility for Hungary to leave the European Union because uh, frequently, and now it became even more frequently, uh, the political position of uh, Budapest authorities, they contradict the general line of uh, European Union, we see it explicitly um, through uh, Russian-Ukrainian war, through the lens of Russian-Ukrainian war, when uh, Hungary actually uh, is supporting uh, Russia, not, let's say, in not the open manner, but still, uh, Mr. Orban is in the very uh, favorable to uh, uh, dictator Vladimir Putin, so, uh, Hungary is uh, um, really trying to pursue its own policy, which uh, contradicts uh, the general policy of European Union, uh, which uh, stands against Russian invasion and stands stands against uh, Vladimir Putin. So, um, do you foresee the possibility for Hungary to leave the uh, European Union, and which repercussions this act uh, will make to the whole general European project? Thank you. First, and the answer to Russia is always, and Russian wars against Europe is always more European unity. So what we need is to have more unity in NATO, in the EU and in the Euro. So when some countries like um, Hungary are not ready for that, it's much better if they leave. Huh? I have no problem with Hungary leaving. We should tell it to Orban every day. You are no longer one of us. Yeah, You can join as Russian Oblast of Hungary. I don't care. It's not a problem for us, it's a problem for Hungary, because Hungary will be much poorer, Hungary will be isolated, Hungary will not be receiving any EU market opportunities, no EU funding, and they will actually never do it, yeah? because uh, the Hungarians will never allow Orban to lead his country out of the European Union, because they are very much aware that they benefit from our freedoms of movement, freedom to work everywhere, freedom to invest and to have investments from everywhere, and also our freedom to have provide services. These are powerful tools which the Hungarians have, and they certainly will never want to give it up. So, and they have also human rights protection, because no matter, no matter what the Hungarian prime minister is doing, there is the European law valid in this country, and it will always be. So, let's please explain it again, I say. We are not just in war since 2020 with Russia, but we are in war since 2014, yeah? and in fact, since 2008. Yeah? So what Russia is constantly doing is looking to buy the political elites of Europe. He, Russia did that as well in Ukraine. Remember what happened under Yanukovych. Yeah? And you know, Orban is similar case in a way like Yanukovych. Yeah? It was before a different prime minister, then he came in, and then Russia offered all these amazing opportunities with this famous um, uh, nuclear power plant for 12 billion euros, with the new gas deal to subsidize the gas consumption, and always Mr. Orban earns a lot of money with this. Remember what your own political elite uh, had uh, offered. I read the interviews of your political leader during Orange Times in the Kiev Post. Yeah? They have told very easily what Medvedev told them. If you get buy the gas from me, <laughs> I give you 1% of the volume. <laughs> That's the deal Russia offers to every political elite. It's huge amounts of money for a person. Imagine Austria has about 6 billion of yearly gas consumption from Russia and 1% for one prime minister. It's very big money. And this is happening exactly in Hungary as well. And so Orban in 2014, and you can see the visits of Miller from Gazprom in 2014. It's all online when he signed the gas contract, when he signed uh, the uh, nuclear contract. And that's huge amounts of money for him. And these things we have to tell very loud to the politicians. We have also to say it very loud that he is a paid agent of uh, uh, Russia and he, the Hungarians will understand that over time and they will also vote him out. 
It didn't work now. He was very cleverly maneuvering here before uh, and during uh, the uh, war and the election. That was extremely unfortunate that he was re-elected. But we have working democracies in European Union as well in Hungary. There will be the time of the end of Orban and he will be voted out and there will be a democratic free uh, Hungary again. And if he really wants to consider leaving the European Union, it will be just speed up to his end and his uh, end of power because the Hungarians certainly don't want to lose these amazing freedoms which Europe gives. Yeah? Because I personally, I'm now 54, I was also a student like you 30 years ago, and I was then not in the European Union. And it was very difficult for me to travel anywhere in the beginning of the 90s. It was very difficult to work abroad for me and all these things. And only when we joined European Union in 95, Austria is also a relatively young country, because by the way, the Soviet Union didn't allow us to join the European Union when it still existed. And only when the Soviet Union broke up and Ukraine ended the Soviet Union, by the way, thank you very much. It was possible for Austria to apply to the European Union. And then I had all these amazing opportunities to work abroad and to, to travel freely. And all these things have uh, been transformational for Austria. It's a much richer country now. Some of you might know Austria. And it's actually a quite developed and rich country now. And it was not so <laughs> before 95. And so this also the Hungarians can remember very well how poor they were before they joined the European Union in 2004. And they certainly don't want to leave it. Yeah? And that the British have left, you know, that's a tragedy of a very specific uh, political context of the migration crisis and the British kind of uh, imperial syndrome. I think the next time uh, there will be also a vote about that one that will be certainly a yes for a return. And I'm quite confident that when we talk about the future in 10 years, that Ukraine and the United Kingdom will be together in the European Union and they will all have the euro and the both of them will be in NATO and it will be a very powerful and very prosperous future which we can build together. And it will be much faster than many in Western politics might think because of this challenge of Russian aggression, which will unite us and will bring us much faster together in NATO, in the EU and in the Euro as well for the United Kingdom. And be sure no country will leave because it's quite secure and quite wonderful inside the European Union and there's great opportunities. And many of the millions of Ukrainians yeah, who have now um, been in safety in Europe, they will return and they will ask exactly for such a lifestyle, for such rights, for such opportunities as well in Ukraine. And the Ukrainian government will have better deliver fast for that because it is absolutely the standard of rights, of opportunities, which every European should have. And the Ukrainians didn't have up to now. And it's time to speed that up, to give these opportunities towards all Ukrainians. And I'm confident that nobody will ever leave the European Union anymore, especially after they have seen how dangerous and lonely and risky and it is when you are alone, as unfortunately Ukraine uh, was now in 2022 in most aspects. But uh, that's of course should never happen again. And you should be as fast as possible in NATO and in the EU and the Euro in order to never walk alone again. Mr. Fecklinger, thank you very much for the lecture. As always, it was very interesting to listen to your, your really a strong uh, advocate for uh, Ukraine being part of the uh, European Union. And uh, it is very important because you're acting uh, in the civil sector and civil sector uh, always uh, um, make a strong push on the politicians to adopt very important decisions in terms of um, Ukrainian inter integration to Euro European Union on both sides uh, in uh, Brussels and uh, in Kiev. So thank you very much for uh, everything you do in this regard. And thank you very much for uh, spending uh, your time uh, giving this lecture to the students uh, of uh, National University of Dessau Academy. We strongly appreciate this, and uh, uh, I hope that uh, in uh, the future you will also continue to give lectures to our students because, again, you share your uh, valuable experience, uh, uh, which is very important uh, for students who want to understand how European Union works and who 
when they will graduate from university, they definitely uh, will um, uh, play a big role uh, in political domain, in economic domain, uh, in uh, the future Ukraine, which will be a part of European Union. Thank you very much, Mr. Fettinger. Thank you very much, uh, dear audience, for being today and listening to uh, Mr. Günther Fettinger's very interesting lecture. Thank you very much and have a nice day. Have a okay. Героям слава. Героям слава. Героям слава.